All right. How's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Stephen Adair, and I am here uh, as a security researcher from the Shadow Server Foundation. Um, also for the day job, I do cyber threat work for a large federal agency. Um, I'm supposed to be co-presenting with Matt Richard, uh, who's obviously not up here. Um, I, I encourage you, if you were going to throw anything or heckle, uh, to save it till his 2 o'clock talk. Um, and even if you weren't going to, I'd really encourage you to harass him or do whatever uh, for him not being here. Um, other than that, uh, our presentation today is on the uh, whole a big Adobe vulnerability that was back in, uh, well, technically January, uh, February time frame. Um, and our presentation is entitled Zero Day Ghostnet with a Zero, um, the Adobe JBIG 2 decode, decode Disclosure Debacle. Um, and the presentation is not as exciting as it sounds, but I find if you set low expectations, it's easier to exceed them. So a quick standard disclaimer, this applies to both Matt and myself. Um, anything we say in here, uh, anything dumb, anything smart, um, it's not uh, on behalf of our employers. Uh, it doesn't represent them in any way, shape, or form. Um, none of the information in here, since we talk about some targeted attack stuff, um, stuff related to cyber espionage, this does not come from our places of work. Um, this does not come from other people's places of work. We're not taking any kind of uh, data we shouldn't have and presenting it here. We have it from other sources, uh, legitimate sources. Um, and we have permission from the sources to uh, present on these topics, share, and do everything we're doing today. So we didn't, uh, we didn't hack anything, do anything illegal, we didn't steal anything, we're, we're really okay with this. So the agenda, uh, quick item, we're going to do a quick background. I know there's a certain number of people here who probably have no idea like, what the hell I'm talking about right now. So we'll give a quick, uh, quick background into the, all the Adobe stuff, what we're actually talking about. Um, the inside story being how this really came to light from our end. Um, I don't know the inner workings of what happened at Adobe or how uh, Sourcefire did all its stuff or any of that good stuff. Uh, we'll tie that right into a timeline, uh, largely related. Um, do a little bit of the an analysis of some of the malicious PDF, uh, why it's relevant, the evolution of them. This is really uh, Matt's slide, so I'm going to talk to them. Um, if it sounds like I'm making stuff up, it's because I am, just making up stuff. Um, then we'll go into a disclosure, the classic... Uh, uh, partial, uh, full, no disclosure. Uh, we're not trying to get and reinvent the wheel or uh, do any kind of crazy new debate or new take on it, but this, this, whole, uh, this whole incident ended up being a really good uh, example of it. It's kind of a good case study if you want to look at the different types of disclosure options and how it went through all of them um, and kind of looks at, we don't really come to a conclusion whether it's good or bad, what's the right one, but uh, we definitely had some uh, interesting results. Um, and then finally, before we conclude, we'll take a look at what we're calling GhostNet in our presentation with a zero. GhostNet being the report that was put out by the Information Warfare Monitor um, in March of this year, um, and it ties back into cyber espionage. So here's a quick background for some of you who don't know what's going on. Um, it's not, I'm not going to go into too long of the details. I'm going to try and speed through these slides since I tend to uh, talk a lot. Um, we're talking about the Adobe a vulnerability in Adobe Acrobat, Acrobat Reader. Um, this is what is known as uh, Adobe's Apple Product Security Advisory, their first one of this year. There's a CV number if you want it. There's, there's tons of other reference numbers. That's what we're talking about. Um, I'm not an expert on JBIG2 or any of that stuff, but uh, it's basically JBIG2 is an image compression format that's used to encode images. So a lot of times you get a PDF with like a, uh, a fax or something's been scanned, like a black and white image a lot of time. Uh, it, it really decreases the size. Um, and then JBIG2 decode. In here in Adobe is the reason we're here today. It's the vulnerable function that resulted in this uh, uh, pretty bad exploit that led to this presentation. So the inside story. So how did it all start? Um, basically, it kind of started with rumors. Uh, there was some stuff going on, some people mentioning a few things, some talk on some lists. There were some discussions about a new vulnerability. No one had any details. It was just a talk of a, this Adobe vulnerability that's affecting multiple versions. It's a zero day but really, really, really lacking any kind of details on what's actually exploited. Um, someone pointed to a semantic page at some point um, that we found had a write-up that was really, it was really vague. Um, the write-up had a mention of this js001.3322.org. Um, that's a host name on a uh, Chinese CN99 uh, dynamic DNS provider, frequently used in malware authors. Um, and that's really all it had. It referenced a, it referenced a PDF. It didn't say it was a zero day. It didn't say it was, and it was very vague. Um, so. I was talking with Matt and realized I'd already had a sample of this. And actually, because I get a lot of samples from different sources um, looking at targeted attacks. This is like your PDF files, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint, Office Docs, all kinds of stuff, uh, Windows help files, .chm. 
Um, I realized I'd actually already analyzed the sample on February 12th, the day of that advisory. So this is around February 13th, 14th that this is like coming to light. So I looked in uh, my DNS monitors. I take all these targeted attacks and I throw them into DNS monitors so we can actually watch where the IPs bounce around so they will change where they're hosted at. Uh, this one I was already in there, and I could quickly go back through my, uh, my repository and see, oh, yeah, here it is. I found it, grabbed a copy of it. Um, and not say I'm not technical, but I'm not the reverse engineering type. I don't know the breakdowns of like JBIG to do code. I don't do a lot of reverse engineering. That's Matt's area. We were, we were working on that. Uh, sent over him. Didn't take him too long to figure out it was a JBIG to the code vulnerability. This is details that were not out there anywhere. This is, we just got it. We just found it. Um, we found it. I mean, someone else obviously found it. We didn't invent it, but we, we found out what it was. So now we had some information other people didn't, and we started looking through our other samples, started working backwards. We started going through uh, even new ones that were coming in, seeing what other ones reference JBIG2 to code um, that are also involved with exploits. Because I mean, JBIG2 to code is a legitimate function, uh, but if it's if you open the PDF, it exploits and puts a Trojan on your computer. That's probably not what it's supposed to do in a, in a good way. Um, so once again, at this point in time, there is no advisory. There's no mention. There's nothing public from uh, Adobe. Uh, we, get, we ping them and kind of said, uh, hey, are you aware of this? They said, what are you talking about? They said, hey, this. And they said, yeah, we were working on that. And that's around the 14th, I believe, 14th or 15th. So we found some more samples. We, we started working back. Um, ultimately, we'd come, you'll see in the, time, the, uh, the timeline, which needs to be updated, uh, when we found some of the earliest samples. Uh, but we, we found more and more people are looking for, more and more rumors. People just didn't, people didn't know what to look for. It really blended in. There weren't a lot of them out there. This was not a widespread exploit. This was being used very targeted attacks. And even then, the targeted attacks were extremely limited. So people didn't know what to look for. So they just opened up all these Adobe files, and it would look just like any other one. Um, so we then became aware of more attacks. So from our sources, we knew that other people were being hit with this. We knew this was, we knew, already knew it was in the wild, but we knew that people were actually being uh, hammered with this exploit. So got a little uh, antsy about that. We're not a big fan of uh, different institutions being hammered with zero day, uh, especially when no one has any information out there to protect themselves. So this is where we opted on the Shadow Server blog to do something we called the partial disclosure. Um, we basically let people know there's a vulnerability one, we didn't mention the function. We didn't know, know any information on how they could recreate the exploit, but we gave them a solution. We said, disable JavaScript. Now, you can read tons and tons of people say, oh, yes, yes, we already knew this. I, I can't remember if we addressed this in the post or not. You could circumvent JavaScript, and I think uh, someone, I don't know if it's immunity or in the Canvas framework, someone actually created something that can do it, but to date, we have never seen an actual targeted exploit that has actually been able to, that actually used a method that circumvented JavaScript. So this solution would work 100% for you, the one that we provided. Uh, to this date, we're not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Well, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another issue, I guess. Well, that's. There's always, lots of Adobe fun out there, but. Yeah. The other solution that was really good is having, if you had DEP on, uh, having that enabled would pretty much stop the exploit as well. Uh, having that on, uh, it, would, it would crash and everything, but it would actually would not exploit the system. Possible also to probably write something that could circumvent that. Uh, we still have yet to see anything uh, like that in the wild. So this results in uh, Adobe publishing an advisory, which is definitely a good thing. It's kind of what we wanted. Um, but it, like I said, it, it, they can't put a lot of the details out there. Um, but they didn't put a workaround. And the key component is that it will be patched in about a month. So that's a, like, that's a long time to wait for something that's already been out for a while. So here's the timeline. Uh, we mentioned earlier the JS001 at 3322.org. Um, that's on January 6th. That's the, uh, we looked through that same, uh, that same host name, which we hadn't seen before um, in any of our other attacks on our other files we've analyzed. Um, and found on Threat Expert, they had a sample from January 6th, um, and then I think another one on January 12th. We don't know that that's related, um, but it, it, it's, we suspect that it could be. There's a couple people who said even going back to December, this exploit existed. We haven't found any evidence of that. Um, our first hash from all the files we had, um, we didn't know the date, but we punched them in the virus total. Um, that date actually needs to be corrected. Matt's not here. I blame him again. Uh, January 16th is the first uh, JBIG2 to code vulnerable file attacking file that we found. Um, so we know as of pretty much about a, a month before we posted the advisory, there were active live exploits that were working in the wild. Um, February 12th, we talked about the semantic post at an advisory. Uh, didn't have a lot of details. We suspect they may have been under an NDA. Uh, 19th was our advisory, same day Adobe advisory. Um, then Sourcefire put out a blog which basically uh, detailed the, what the actual function was. They then got a copy of it. Um, I think they had it in their repository. So 
Yeah, well, okay, that's, that's, well, not, I, I did not use JBIG in my post. You're thinking of the McAfee advert log, but the Shadow server did not have JBIG2 in it anyway. Yeah, that's, it's incorrect, but thanks. Um, anyway, the Millware, the, the exploit, and you can, you can pull it up right now. Feel free to pull up the post. It's, it's right there. Uh, feel free to pull it up and show me where it says anything about JBIG. It doesn't. Anyway, um, so we got the, the Millworm proof of concept came out. Or excuse me, someone else put out the proof of concept, got picked up on Millworm on the 23rd. Um, the source fire, they put out a homebrew patch. So that was actually uh, something that really helped. They have a, they edited, it, they took the DLL file from, uh, I don't know exactly what they changed in it, but they were able to make it so if the exploit would load in, the, in Adobe, it actually would not exploit the system. So Adobe, or excuse me, Sourcefire put out that, and shortly after they also put out some clam AV signatures and sort signatures that would help as well. Um, then also March 5th, we started to see a large increase in JBIG2 exploits. Um, this is a number of different modified ones. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, and then finally, Adobe patched uh, shortly after. Um, it actually came in piecemeal. Uh, it was one after another for different versions. It took them a little bit of time to patch the, uh, the different 8, 9, and so on. And then uh, different OS flavors were patched later on. So this is starting on Matt's slides, um, I'm going to go on to basically give me some notes on his. Uh, so some of the key items you probably wanted to add that I'm not going to touch on, but I'll do this best I can. So kind of some of the key components in, in analyzing the malicious PDF, especially if you want to start doing like uh, attacker attribution and comparing. So a lot of the metadata is pretty useful. There's some interesting information in it. Um, you got the encoded JavaScript or other attack code, and then you got a lot of the other object tags that are in there. Um, so you start to notice things that aren't in other files. So the, all the exploit files may have JBIG2 to code in it, for example. Um, you might have uh, Java, other JavaScript tags, rich media, or flash things in there. Um, and you can look for other unusual parts in the PDF, for example. If you see um, an embedded executable, either in clear, XORD, or otherwise, that's a, probably a clear indicator this is probably a bad PDF, and it starts to match. Uh, when you start comparing them to uh, other PDFs. So what Matt has on here, he said PDFs are probably derived from any attributes. He calls it like the, uh, in his terms, the DNA. There's some, there's some parts that you start to see in PDF files that you're not going to see in a lot of others. And if they start matching and you have a lot of matches, they're probably derived from the same initial uh, exploit pack or exploit developer. There are things that you just don't see um, in the wild or in normal PDFs a lot of the time. Um, and then a lot of these also, if you start modifying a PDF, like in Adobe, um, a lot of them keep the original content and start adding on to it, so the old stuff's there. Um, and one of, the, one of the cute items they always have are these timestamps. Now, timestamps can always be bogus, but we touch on this because you start to see this. We see this in a lot of the targeted attacks that have to do with Adobe, but especially here, too. You start seeing GMT plus 0800, which is Chinese uh, time zone. So that's a, a pretty interesting item that you start to see when you start wanting to correlate where this stuff's coming from. So early PDFs, uh, in his slides, uh, had one or two payloads. Uh, you see on there the, uh, the metadata at the top, pretty, uh, pretty unique. All these X's, XXX e for the email, and then you have X's and D's. This, this is not something that you see very, normal, very normally, and then you wouldn't get this on accident. So you start to be able to compare the exploits and the different files out there, and you see a lot of matches. Um, they also use the uh, octal encoding for the JavaScript, which was very large. Um, that's where you have the the backslash and then the three numbers. Uh, that, that was a, a big component that made these files around a little over 800 kilobytes. So they're, they're pretty large files. Um, they had, like I said, a lot of unique metadata. And then they had a couple XOR keys that were the same throughout all the different exploits. Um, and like the initial sample that we found that we initially knew of was this js And this And this is an example right from it. So from the semantic uh, advisory, this is, what, this is what we found. We've got the original js one from. Um, didn't have a lot of details, was pointed out to us, um, but it did have on here the, uh, down on the bottom, you can see the uh, command and control server that it uses. That's how we originally found it. Comparing the virus total data before the 12th, um, there, were, there were antivirus vendors that would pick up um, these malicious files, but it was not because of the specific detection for this exploit. It was picking up on other things like odd JavaScript or shell code or other, other weird things depending on the variation. Um, so starting about February 12th, we believe it may have been because of under, under NDA, I think maybe McAfee and Symantec, I believe, started detecting this. And soon after uh, the disclosure and additional details from Sourcefire, others were able to start uh, picking it up and adding better AV detection. And at that point, the uh, files got shared around a bit more. So the first known malware, like we said, uh, was a, a, a ghost remote access Trojan. Uh, beacon to js 31322org on port, 22, or port 220. 
Um, so the Ghost from Onexus Trojan is a pretty powerful uh, Trojan used by a lot of attackers. Uh, it's, it's out there and it's open, it's available. You can download this uh, yourself and set it up, but it's, it's very frequently used by Chinese malware authors. Um, and attackers, and what they do, it allows them to get on the system, they can run a lot of functions, they can sit on the computer as if they are sitting at it, they have like full control over the system, it's pretty powerful. Um, and like I said, Symantec had mentioned it on the 12th, and then we can see going back to the 6th of January that this very sample, uh, the very same Trojan existed, so uh, not sure exactly when it first started using the PDF, but we know as of the 12th it did. So the earliest sample we had uh, goes back to January 16th. Uh, this is the, the earliest one we could find. We've, a few people said maybe a week or two before this they had samples, but we haven't seen any. This is the best we can do. Uh, it's pretty much identical to the, uh, the JS001 sample we were talking about. Got the same author, the same email, the same web. The, the encoding is the same, the same XOR keys. So it's obviously derived from the same kit, except for here it is nearly a month earlier. So this thing has been around for a while. It's changed hands a few times, and we found some other samples from different uh, attackers that are using it. In this particular one, so this is what I'm talking about, the AV detection. This is that sample from Virus Total on the 16th. It had five, five out of 39 could detect it, uh, but they, what they weren't looking for was things like, uh, it, wasn't partic it wasn't specifically detecting this exploit. It was flagging on other things. So you were still somewhat protected, but not, you didn't have very good protection out there, and you weren't specifically protected from this vulnerability. And you can see the file size. It's nearly 830 kilobytes, which we'll see in a minute gets dramatically reduced. So this earliest sample, once again, just to talk about the malware behind it. Um, so the first known attacker that we have with this that we know of, um, their malware dropped the Poison Ivy remote access Trojan. Very similar to Ghost, it's pretty powerful, um, has a lot of rootkit functionalities, a lot of different things you can do with it. It's also favored quite uh, heavily by Chinese malware authors, uh, but it is, once again, open and available on the web. Anyone can download it. You can go out there and do it yourself. Um, and this sample is connected to a host name called yoyo.networksec.net on port 443. Um, in this sample, we talk about how some are a little more advanced than others. This one, when it crashed, it did not open up or provide any kind of replacement PDF. So, it, uh, so someone opened it, they would see a crash and they wouldn't get anything new. Not as advanced. Um, probably just a uh, bad choice on the attack, uh, attacker's part because some of the other samples did do this. Um, but this is also an attacker we've known previously as of this, uh, December using Office Zero Day. Um, we believe this is some few different exploits. I believe they also had the WordPad text converter exploit. So this is not the first time these guys have popped up with some form of a zero day. So they're probably not uh, just some random person testing or playing around. Um, we don't have any information on the back end of their server, but it, it starts to lend an eye to uh, a cyber espionage related activity. So February samples, this is where the code starts getting a little better. From February 7th and 10th, we start getting some new samples that we looked, so we looked at and see how they start to change. So this is a couple, this is a few days before the, uh, still the old, the, the February 12th sample we had that was identical to the one in January 16th. Um, so once again, working off Matt's slides here, uh, you start seeing some of the differences, uh, PDF header changes. Um, so it has similar heap spray, the same comments in it. So if you looked at the, the code, the actual comments in there were the same. So they were just reusing it. But now the big difference, they were able to dramatically shrink the file because they just used flake to code. So now instead of having all that gigantic uh, octal encoding in there in the clear, it now is all uh, encoded. So it took up a lot less space. So you went from 800, 830 KB to about 800, 108 KB. Uh, so the question is, are these new attackers or just people that took the exploit and are trying to refine it? Um, the, we never saw any overlap from our initial uh, attackers, uh, the command and control servers, to the new ones. So we don't know. They could be, uh, it could be new people with new command and control servers, new Trojans, or it's just someone who got a copy of it and started messing around with it to improve it. Um, and then some of the PDFs have multiple revisions showing, like I said, uh, what changed in each revision. You can see some of the differences. And once again, if you take a look at the, the bottom there, um, you see the, the attackers, when they started modifying it, they now have a... Uh, mod date that involves plus 0800 once again. Um, obviously, it could be anyone could say that to anything, but that's where we are once again. So, code got a little better. AV detection did too. Um, this time, I, they flagged shell code signatures for a few of them. The other ones pretty much remained the same for the JavaScript. Uh, files a lot smaller. Uh, you take that for what it's worth. So now we can see the attackers are evolving. Um, so we had the initial encode was improved. Uh, we saw the sizes shrink a lot, so it's a lot smaller. Um, and then we saw better attacks. I mean, it's pretty standard operation for an attacker with a, 
uh, targeted office or PDF or doc file exploit to have a replacement document open. Uh, the initial couple we saw didn't do that. They got a little better. If some, this is probably someone who's a little bit smarter um, had this happen. Um, and still, the attackers, some attackers don't have the exploit. Um, so those that didn't have it were uh, still looking for it. So this is the point at which the millworm exploit becomes weaponized. So the millworm proof of concept, it's actually, or the proof of concept itself came out on the 22nd, posted the millworm on the 23rd. Um, you can see this is, this is actually run through um, all this. The formatting you hear, see here is a tool that Matt Richard wrote um, called the PDF parse. He said he'll make it available. Uh, he's not here to speak to that, but uh, I, I don't know how to, where, you where to tell you to go to get a copy of it, but he said he'll make it available if anyone wants it, so feel free to email him at the end of this. Um, so he scans it, looks for some key objects and other components of it. Um, the red is kind of what changed between them. So you have your proof of concept on the left, and then on your right you have the PDF in the wild. This PDF in the wild, we don't detail the attack on it. It's one we're actually very well familiar with. It's an attacker group that's been around for a couple of years, um, heavily into cyber espionage activity. Uh, they actually took the code off a of millworm, and they, uh, they edited it, modified it, and made it work for them. Um, and once again, the mod date of 0800 appears in there. They edited it with Adobe. Um, they did some stuff on it with uh, GhostScript. Um, so Tacker actually took it, that, that proof of concept, and weaponized it. And I mean, there's lots of other people who were playing around with it, but this is uh, one that was actually used in real live attacks. So at this point, it brings us to the whole disclosure. Um, so this is a regular old debate. Um, it's a long-running like, debate, no, one, no clear answer. Um, there's pros and cons to pretty much all the ones that we saw. Um, so when and what to disclose, here's a, here's a quote that Matt liked that he put in here. Um, I actually kind of like it too. This is from H.D. Moore. He was actually talking on the Adobe issue from the 23rd. And I just read the slide. He said, the strongest case for information disclosure is when the benefit of releasing the information outweighs the possible risk. In this case, like many others, the bad guys already won. Exploits are already being used in the wild, and the fact that the rest of the world is just now taking notice doesn't mean that these are new vulnerabilities. And he says, at this point, the best strategy is to raise awareness, distribute the relevant information, and apply pressure on the vendor to release a patch. Especially with the, the last line there, we agree wholeheartedly. I think everyone involved in the disclosure process here was pretty much on the same page with that. So no disclosure was a major fail. Um, we're not here to like beat up on anyone, so it's not, we're, not, we're not beating up on Adobe. We've seen a lot of things just from a casual observer improvement that we like, um, not that for whatever it's worth, our opinion. Um, so obviously Adobe, they didn't dis disclose it right away. Um, would it have made a big difference? I, I don't know. And maybe they could have worked with more antivirus vendors. I, I don't know the case, but obviously no disclosure didn't help here. And he said the AV vendors, uh, we think some of them may have been under NDA, so they couldn't put a whole lot out there. Um, are there others who could have noticed it or found it or done something? Uh, that's a question. Uh, so basically, in this case, from no disclosure, the only ones who were benefiting were the attackers. They were running rampant for at least over a month before anyone even started to do anything about it. And they had another month from there before there was any kind of patch from Adobe. So, like I said, we, did, we were in favor of partial disclosure, and we only give it a partial win. Um, so they had issued an advisory, that's great. So that's a, I mean, what did we get out of that? So Adobe said there's an issue out there, so I guess people know we're not lying. That's the only real plus of it. Um, potential workarounds, we like that because we had potential workarounds. Um, they could be circumvented, but they were valid, they worked. Um, they prevented stuff from people who were being exploited. I've seen a few cases where that happened. Um, and people at least had like, some form of fighting chance, and we're just complete sitting ducks at this point. Um, and then it also led to the, the full disclosure, which is kind of like a, a gray area depending on who you talk to. So full disclosure, we said it succeeds. So we, there's some things we liked about it, and there's others we didn't. So SourceFire pulls the, the vuln details basically a day later. Um, and it's not complete. And I think they actually, uh, I think McAfee actually let some of, it, some of the cat out of the bag from one of the presentations I saw um, in, a, in a form of uh, a hex editor or something they were looking at one of the files. So you could have actually taken that and figured out some of it. So it, it was kind of out there. Someone would have, it would have gotten out there one way or another anyway. Uh, but they were able to release an unofficial patch a day later. So we the, consider that actually a pretty good uh, win. I, don't, I have no idea how many people actually were able to apply that, but at least, like I said, there's another solution out there. Um, but then the millworm exploit came out pretty much the same day. Um, and that pretty led to some new detection. It was still pretty weak from what we saw in the samples. So at least now people are able to better detect it. Probably antivirus detection started improving at this point. More information is out there. There's more people know what to look for. But this also leads to the quicker weaponized exploit development. So like you said, disclosure kind of leads to new attacks. Um, this is going to happen regardless, but it happened a little quicker, we think, in some cases. So like I said, the proof of concept code, the 22nd, uh, Millworm shortly after. One of the codes references the uh, SourceFire blog. 
Um, Sourcefire also released the very next day, though, they got some Clam AV and Start signatures out there um, that would detect uh, some of the attacks, uh, which would later get changed and they wouldn't be as effective, but that's pretty much the cat and mouse game of antivirus detection. Um, so it takes a little over a week from this point where we start seeing derivative attacks that are modified more and more, so start changing little pieces, start doing different things to avoid detection. Um, and then by March 5th, we basically, we said all hell is broken loose and there's massive uptick in attacks, basically, I think, because a lot of people knew the impending uh, patch was coming out, they really started firing them out there. We saw a massive increase in the number of exploits coming in. So signature power. So this is the, this is some of the signatures. Um, I believe Matt, got, Matt posted these on here. I think they're the ones uh, Sourcefire put out for the Clam AV, and I believe that's maybe their um, sort signature. So what it does is they look for the, uh, a lot of times they look for the JBIG decode, the stream followed by the um, carriage return and the line feed. Uh, but the PDF spec actually allows just a uh, carriage return without a line feed, which is one small issue for things that started evading detection. Uh, as you see in the red, that's the uh, carriage return line feed, same thing with the, the snort signature. So we started seeing evasion signatures. This is the case, this is always the case with antivirus though and other things. A lot of them are, uh, unless they're fully heuristics based, they pretty much match uh, exact known attacks the best they can, um, which in this case would probably, for a while, would get the bulk of them. Uh, but they can quickly change it. Like I said, they can use just the uh, carriage return. Um, they can change some of the values in the exploit that would that cause it that would no longer be detected. Um, and then some other things, they replace the letters with ordinal values or they start finding creative ways or try, trying to change the case. Um, and for some, some things would not detect that. So basically, right now our patch is our main solution. Um, this is a picture of the Domokin. Every time you open malicious PDF, God kills a kitten. I'm probably going to hell now. <laughs> so Final tie-in, uh, this is where we start talking about, this is our tie-in to GhostNet. GhostNet, the report that was put out by the Information Warfare Monitor. Um, so is there any connection between the malware um, and the GhostNet report? So that's a good question. Um, is it cyber espionage or just fun and games? Is this random malware? Um, is this something like that we, re it's really not a big deal. So March 29th, 2009, this is when GhostNet report came out from the Information Warfare Monitor. Uh, what they put out was a report, uh, I think there might be one or two of the guys here, uh, I talked with them, uh, one of them pretty extensively and another one a little bit. Um, what they did is they looked into some of the targeted attacks uh, using a lot of these same type of attack techniques using like different uh, uh, Adobe files or using uh, office documents and things that were targeting the Tibetan community and they had uh, some pretty much unprecedented access to the uh, office of the Holy Dam Dalai Lama. Um, and what they found in the report, if you, it's a pretty long report, they found I mean, a whole network of systems being controlled by these guys, the different attackers. Um, some, of the, some of the attacker sets on there, it's not real clear whether or not they're actually related. There's probably more than one group attacking Tibetans in the uh, Office of the Dalai Lama. Um, but th they had some pretty inf good information in there. And uh, so some of the questions that are being raised, this report came out in March, is what's the relation between what we're seeing now and the stuff that was put out by the GhostNet report? So. Is there a connection? The best answer is not exactly. Um, I'll put that with a question mark because there are some loose ties to it. So I have to keep in mind one thing is that the GhostNet research was from 2008. So this being a 2009 vulnerability, the vast majority of what's in GhostNet report was from the previous year. Um, this exploit is not known to have existed in 2008, or excuse me, the uh, in the wild exploit is not known to exist in 2008. Um, so our title, GhostNet, actually with a zero, is kind of initially, um, so. Matt wanted to put together his presentation, and so I agreed to, to present with it and to kind of late, he just took the ghost net with a zero um, just off the bat based on the initial malware that we saw. So it was the ghost remote access erosion, which is spelled with a zero. Uh, it's kind of a play on ghost net without it. Um, so we weren't really expecting to find any close ties to it. It's kind of a nice, uh, eh, cyber espionage, it's related, it's interesting. Um, so we just kind of put it in there. Uh, but we found a loose connection after all. So we see from the report there's three different, there's several different command and controls listed in there, but there's three of them in particular that we're familiar with. So a lot of the attacks from GhostNet um, we've seen, have copies of it, we're aware of. Uh, but in particular, three of the command and controls listed in the uh, GhostNet report, McCaffreyResponse.org, MSNXY.net, and LookByTheWay.net, um, these are ones that have a loose tie uh, to what, we're, what, we, what we saw in the early attacks in January. Um, so this malware is often called Trojan Infol. Uh, what it does is steals different information from the systems. It'll rip off files, it'll take off credentials, it'll take off emails. Uh, usually attacker specified, uh, they'll, they'll beacon in. 
Um, the beginning with the commands that look like this. So they'll post different data. Um, they identify themselves with the computer name and the MAC address. Um, and then the attacker will respond back with what they want from the system. Um, and I actually think I actually owe, if Martin Van Hornbeck's here, I actually owe him a beer because I had the Trojan name wrong. So it's actually Infol and not Ryler, which they're easily mixed up. Um, so it steals various information. Um, it's been this one's been around for quite a while. I think the first mention of it on an antivirus page is sometime in 2004 uh, on one of the IC the Storm Center, the Sands blog. Uh, they mentioned this a while back for Tibetan attacks uh, using this very same thing. So that, that, this malware is not very common. It, it ties directly back into the GhostNet report. This is what the malware looks like. They have this in their report. Um, so we went back and looked at our earliest samples. We, we actually only had uh, four that we could find that we could confirm were from January. Uh, the first one we already talked about, it beacon to YoYo Network Sec. Um, we had one that went to mail.ntimobile.com, one that went to uh, any mail that's so webmail.com. Um, and then we had the last one in the red, uh, search.torusclb.com. Um, so this is the one where we actually found a similarity. So these four different Trojans, uh, different con or completely different Trojans, different command and control servers, um, but one of them is, uh, has a similarity to GhostNet. So the first one that we had a similarity to was, or the only one really, was search.tourist.clb.com. Not only is this uh, one that had a similarity, it's one, it's a known command and control to us. It's one that we've seen before. Uh, we've seen it in other attacks. It's the Enfold Trojan, like I said. This is a very uncommon Trojan. There's only, uh, in terms of total number of IP addresses dealing with, probably seen less than, uh, at a given point in time, active, less than 10. This is very... Uh, pretty much seen in a lot of attacks originating and coming from China, uh, usually against the Tibetan groups, but we also started to see some other stuff. Like we said, uh, it shares IPs address. So this host, we have several other command and controls we know of that are on the same IP address, is search.torusclb.com. And these are all hosts that we know, and a couple of them have been involved in attacking uh, entities of the European Union. So they've gone directly after EU and European hosts. So this starts to be a, a decently interesting and strong uh, cyber espionage tie-in because this thing is being hosted on the same box we know has been attacking uh, EU entities with different targeted attacks, different exploits. So, so like I said, search, here's from our DNS monitor. Search that Taurus CLB is hosted at this very moment. Uh, I've had a few different IP addresses over time at 60.10.4.94, Chinese IP address. Um, there's a few other hosts, blueNNT.com, uh, ggsddup.com. If you do a lot with the uh, targeted malware attacks. These are probably ones you probably come across at some point in time. Um, this is that Trojan, very uncommon. Sharing IP addresses with these. So some other, so just taking some of the file names. Uh, sometimes we have file names, sometimes we don't. Um, you can look at some of them having to do with Brussels, Exhibit Imitation, Sweden, uh, public, planning for the public procurement. These are not like, uh, you're running the, some of them are not run of the mill. Uh, a lot of them, if you open them, they would crash. Like I said, they'd open a new file. A lot of those new files had specifically to do with uh, European conferences or things going on in different parts of Europe, whether it was Sweden, um, Belgium, other, other places, Germany. So these are uh, very in line with one another from the di across the different domains that were attacking other uh, EU entities. So we saw anything, a lot of them were like JBIG2 decode exploits, but even one of them was an older PowerPoint exploit. If we go back further, I think we have some samples that attack like uh, MSO6, uh, different Word doc vulnerabilities. So some of these have been around for quite a while, and they've been attacking quite a, a number of different things. So we started to get to the cyber espionage in JBIG2. Um, we know that even the earliest of JBIG2 samples um, can be tied back to what we are sure is cyber espionage. So there's a, there's a number of them where there's even a few samples where uh, we've been provided information on the back end. We know who's been targeted. We've seen the infected host. So we know some of these have definitely been used to attack uh, financial systems or foreign governments, things like that. Um, and many other samples been related or other known attacks, like the, the past screen, um, we're going to talk about in a minute. I'll go back to the JS001, uh, another item we've seen from that. Uh, different groups appear to be operating kind of with the same exploits. Um, they, we, we didn't really see a lot of overlap in the initial stuff, which is kind of surprising. It seemed at least four or five different groups had the exploit for about a month, and they, they didn't really fire it out a lot. Like, we didn't see massive influx of it. Uh, either that or people weren't realizing what they had, and it just wasn't getting reported and down through the chain. Um, so we're not sure how it stayed. So it stayed relatively quiet, yet it seemed to be in the hands of multiple different groups. Um, so another interesting item is all the initial command and control servers pointed back to Chinese IP addresses. So this is coincidence. Um, eh, it's possible. 
So interesting enough, the JS001, that 3322.org connection, uh, how does that tie back to cyber espionage? Well, it currently sits on a Chinese IP address, like we said. Um, it's up there. That host also has another domain called cyhk.3322.org on it. Um, it. They share the IP address. Now, who cares? Why is that interesting? Well, the reason that's kind of interesting is there's re multiple reports out there. One of them was put out by Symantec um, that in April 2008, there were email attacks against Japanese businesses um, that were purporting to be, that were spoofed from the Japanese government. And if they uh, succeeded, they beaconed back to the CYHK3322.org hostname, uh, which now also shares an IP address, most likely run by the same attacker uh, that runs JS001, our guys that had the, uh, one of the earlier people to get the JBIG2 decode exploit. So this is the look at, uh, we took a, it's like a sampling of about 82 different uh, host names that were involved in uh, JBIG2. There were host names that came as a result of JBIG2 uh, PDF files that exploited um, and took the IP addresses that they bounced around to over the period of time. So like, like sometimes some people will change every couple of days. Uh, some of them since February have been on the same IP address till today. As so you got a mixed bag. But if you take a look at the uh, samples, you see that Excuse me, China, uh, 202 of the 301 different IP addresses uh, were there, so about 67%. And you go Korea, Hong Kong, US, Taiwan, and Japan, and then it just kind of works down with the intermingling between different countries. I mean, bad guys or anyone who does this, they can hack a server anywhere, or they can take a credit card, and, or they can uh, buy a server anywhere. So it doesn't definitively prove anything once again, but we can start to come to some, uh, some conclusions. Um, so obviously our first conclusion is that China is behind all attacks involving zero-day exploits and cyber espionage. <laughs> okay, that's, I mean, you might hear that in the news or something. Okay, that's obviously just a, a joke. So if you're going to quote me on that, please add the just kidding at the end. Uh, but no, in, in seriousness, uh, so we know the conclusions. As we say, there's a group. There's multiple groups out there. Um, there's people that do it for... Obviously, uh, to sell it or profit, um, there's other people uh, who do it to get what they need um, uh, from systems. So there's out there, they're, they're making them, and they're, they're, some of them manage to stay pretty quiet with their exploits. Um, another thing we need to realize from this, we can't fully rely on the security community to identify and protect us from zero day, and it's kind of common sense, but it's just another item that's kind of highlighted out there. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people out there looking at the same files. Like I said, if they are getting, uh, I don't know how many PDFs to come in a day to different uh, antivirus vendors, but if they're getting like hundreds of them, thousands of them, and one of them is slightly different like this, like I said, there wasn't a mass, there wasn't tons, and there wasn't like hundreds or thousands of JBIG2 to, uh, code Adobe exploits coming in, there was just a couple, uh, it, it's kind of hard for them to identify. So our guess is probably someone got hit with it, reported it, and that's how the initial detection and uh, people started looking into it, Adobe and the antivirus vendors. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a real good way out there for security community to protect us uh, right off the bat. Um, and we say it seems like full and partial disclosure fail us to some degree, but they also succeed. But what's very clear is that no disclosure um, obviously was the worst option of all of these. Uh, so if, if people start to find out about stuff, or I mean, like I said, I don't know, I'm not in Adobe shoes, but it seems like if they could, saying something a little bit sooner probably would have been a better solution. Um, so then our bad actors, whether it's GhostNet or GhostNet our way or anyone, they're pretty much busy at work. We know this for a fact. There's, there's zero days pretty frequently in different... Uh, different file formats that we see. Um, they're always looking for new ways around, new exploits um, in the systems. It's been happening for a long time, uh, but they've been pretty busy at work. Adobe's had a few other issues recently. Uh, I'll touch on that real quick on the last slide. And another thing is a key item Matt really want to put in here, PDFs carry a lot of useful information. Um, so like all the, like you start editing, it keeps old revisions, all the header information, the mod dates. If you, if you can trust the data or, or it's valid, there's actually a lot of useful information there, especially if you want to start doing tracking back different attacks, seeing how they evolve. So for example, um, the one taken from Millworm when it was actually weaponized, if you decoded it, they actually left in all the same, it was the exact same code. Um, a lot of the words were down to the words. So you could see that the weaponized version was without a doubt taken from uh, Millworm. So that's, what, that's what's kind of interesting, some of the data, a lot of the data that's inside PDFs. And then they start editing it with other files, they start adding in other timestamps. You can see other information. You can start kind of trying to figure out who it who it ties back to. So final, some of the final conclusions. So kind of this, it, it started. As, I think it really served as a lesson learned to the community. A lot of people came together. A lot of people argued. A lot of people did different things. A lot of people pointed fingers. Um, but in the end, 
Uh, I think a lot of people learned some lessons that helped with the next time. So this is not the first time this has occurred. Uh, it's not going to be the last time. Um, I think we've already seen some improvement from Adobe, like for example, with their recent flash vulnerability. Um, they seem to have got, maybe it was easier for them to patch, actually, but they, they got some stuff turned around quicker. They got advisory out quicker. Um, it, it seems like people are starting to, to learn and get some better uh, uh, feedback and response from it all. So that is, uh, that is our presentation. Thanks for attending. Uh, like I said, Matt Richard didn't make it. I, you can ask him for his tool. You can harass him at 2 o'clock. Feel free to do whatever. Feel free to come find me later. Thank you. Thank you.